Right. Uh, let's start. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Uh, there was a faculty hiring interview ongoing. And then it was a little prolonged. Yeah. Uh, today we will learn about the uh, one step. We will go for one step forward uh, from the above overflow attack. And then the, I will introduce some of the historical document at the end. So like, we are actually following the trace of the like the top level hackers in 1996 for the first web overflow. And then this is 1997 one. And then we will climb up until like the, we reach to the like the current era is a 2020. So so now now like the, you might feel like the oh hacking is too easy, but the, it's not that not that easy, but the, not that difficult. So like the please hang tight. And uh, so for the logistics, uh, we already passed the due date for week one, but the, you still have a chance to get the 50% of the credits for the rest of the challenges. And then the, it applies for the each challenge. So suppose you submitted the, like a challenges for before the due date, and then those will be like the guaranteed to have like a 100% credit. And then the, those the challenges submitted later, the due date will have a 50% uh, for the one week uh, grace period. And then same thing applies to the week two, but uh, it's important that the week two challenges are due on the next Monday. Yeah, it's quite shorter than like the week one because uh, week one requires a little more, a little bit more time to understand the disassembly. But uh, I believe like after you get familiar to the, those kind of assemblies, and from week two to week five, we will just use like the. Uh, very little knowledge about the assembly just for like identifying arguments and then uh, where the buffer is and those are mostly. So that's why I set the due date a little shorter. Uh, any questions for the logistics? Then let's go forward. And then uh, let's do a very short recap about uh, what we are doing for the buff overflow. Then let me move this one somewhere here. Yeah. Right. So we learned about the buffer overflow attack and then what that is. So there is a buffer, but because the C language, yeah, it does not have the notion of like the any kind of security whenever you go over some of the buffer boundary or something. But even if the compiler knows, they only generates a warning, yeah, not the error. So like a buffer overflow is completely allowed in C. And also when the uh, source code is got compiled into the binary format, and then the compiler will remove all the information about the what is the buffer size or those kind of thing. So that's why CPU will never know uh, where is the buffer boundary or something. And then that's the data of the 1997 or something. But uh, uh, recently we have a more advanced uh, tactics, but uh, uh, we will learn about that uh, when we get to the defense part of the lecture. Okay. So basically we can fill any kind of, any number of bytes if the uh, input function allows. So uh, in the most of challenges in week two, uh, there is a buffer far less than the size of the 128 bytes. But the uh, fgets function will always uh, receive like up to 128 bytes. So you can fill uh, a lot of bytes on the stack and then you can overflow the data. And then <clears throat> in last lecture, uh, we were focusing on the directly overriding the return address. So it's quite straightforward because like whenever we make a function call, uh, the CPU uh, re required to create a new stack frame. And then we learned about the, how that stack frame is managed with the EBP and ESP. And then right at the point at EBP plus four, and then RBP plus eight for the 64 bit, there will be a return address. So if you make uh, your stack composition like uh, the something shown on the right side, then when it gets to the fun function epilogue, so the first instruction, will move the ESP up near the uh, EDP and then pop ESI, then ESP will be the same value as the EBP. Then pop EBP, that will store the EBP as a saved EBP, but at this time we don't care about that because the, the next part is return. So it will just run the getter shell. Then we don't need to care about the rest of what rest of the program do because we already succeeded on like the getting a shell and then we can run arbitrary command. 
So that was the buffer overflow attack that we ran, uh, learned. Yeah. And then, uh, so take a look at this function epilogue. And um, uh, so previously, when students asked about the question about like, uh, how do we know this kind of the size for the uh, how do we reserve the stack for each stack frame? And then I describe it as like the compiler knows that the, the size of the local variable uh, that each function uses. So that's how we reserve the stack. But that there's a, another way to restore the stack without using this kind of number. So in the function uh, prolog, yeah, we reserved like the 0x54 bytes. And then that's why at the function epilogue, we need to add that to restore that. So that's how it works. But the purpose of the doing this is like that we want to make the ESP to be equal to EBP to pop the save EBP and the return address. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is that there is a, another way to restore the stack frame, not using this kind of numbers. And then those instructions are called leave and return. Yeah. And then we need to understand the, what is the semantic of the leave instruction. So the, uh, the similar to the return instruction, the semantic of the return instruction is just a pop EIP. Right. So the similarity to that, the semantic of the leave instruction, what it does is like the uh, internally, if we run the leave instruction, uh, the CPU runs these two instructions. So first thing, what it does is like that it will move EB, e, EBP to be uh, ESP to be same as EBP and then pub EBP. Then we will see how it can restore the stack correctly. So whenever you see the leave and return, you can interpret that as a move EVP, ESP, pub EVP, and then return. Then let's try to run the three instructions in order, and then take a look at the stack computation. So after you overflow buffer and then fill some of the bytes, at the end of the function, it will run leave, then internally, it runs at the move the value of the EBP to ESP. And that actually does not move EBP, that changes ESP, right? So ESP will be at here. So this is great because like we don't need to like add 0x54 or that kind of number. So if we run just leave and it will set the ESP value to be same as EBP, then pop EBP will change this EVP value to be the saved EVP value. And then because the instruction is pop, ESP need to one block up, right? So that's why it moves like this. So these two instructions, moving ESP to be at the position of EVP and then pop EVP. That happens at the same time, yeah, within the leave instruction. So that actually restore the ESP and EVP value as like the, as before, like right before we call the function. So that's how we can easily maintain the call stack. Yeah. And then the reason why I the show that like the add 0x54 and then this one. So the, depending on the compiler, we don't know like the, uh, the, what kind of code will be there. So that depending on the compiler, they generate the different code. Some compiler prefers like the, pop EVP manually. And then some other compiler tries to use the leave instructions. And then for the challenges for buffer flow uh, five, six, seven, eight, and then for the challenges of the buffer flow uh, zero, one, two, three, four, uh, I use a different compiler to compile that because they do have a different uh, uh, function epilogue. So today we will learn about the frame pointer attack and then the, instead of focusing on the overriding the return address, we will focus on the overriding the save the EVP. Yeah. So uh, not just for like the, the return address, save the EVP also affects on the how we use the stack. Yeah. 
then the main goal of the today's lecture is to understand uh, uh, to understand the effect of the uh, effect on the system. What if the hackers can uh, manipulate the EBP value arbitrarily? Yeah. And then the, to recall that the, what's the meaning of the ESP and EBP? ESP will always point to the end of the current program stack. And then EBP will point to the uh, start of the current stack frame. Yeah. And then we will manipulate those kind of the stack frame. So basically, uh, so stack frame is maintained as a hierarchical. But the, by changing EVP, what we will do is like the uh, so stack frame must move a hierarchical like this. But uh, after leave instruction, we will make the stack to be somewhere different area. Yeah, that uh, then like the execution uh, flow could be changed uh, arbitrarily. Uh, I know that uh, right now uh, my wordings are not that clear uh, in your mind but uh, you will see how it works. So the uh, restriction here is that uh, for the preferable flow challenge of five and six, uh, I set the, uh, you can overwrite up to full value of the EBP, but the, you cannot overwrite any bytes of the return address. Yeah. And in that case, the challenge asks you to run the ghetto shell function. Yeah. And you can only change this value, not the return address. Then the challenge is like, can you make it run the get or shell function? And then we will focus on the function epilog, and then we will see how the changed value on the EVP affects on the uh, state of the uh, stack frame. So leave return is like the move EBSP to EVP, and then pop EVP, and then return. So by just taking a look at this, it will return to the uh, original return address so that we cannot change the return address. So at the first return, yeah, it's just a regular yeah, regular execution as we expected. Yeah. But this is problematic. And then specifically, this is problematic if there is a two, there are two returns in the execution chain. And then this is quite general. Uh, so think about it. In the most of cases, you will have a main function and then there are some other function, but uh, we usually nest a lot of functions. And then there are a lot of cases that uh, we will have a double return Yeah, in some of the cases. So in buffer overflow level five, uh, we have a call stack like uh, starting from the main function, it calls a run function, and then it will call into function. And then you will see that, that there's an additional run function. And then that is the thing that makes the, this kind of attack possible. But uh, it's not like the uh, artificial. In the most of the cases, you will write a lot of functions and then uh, execute in the nested way. That's why. And then we will run, we will return in this function. And then we will also see what if, what happened if the computer at CPU runs the, the leave return at the run function. Because there will be another leave return at the end of the run function. Yeah, that's why. Then let's take a look at the second return. So if we run the leave return in the receive input with the changed EVP value, then like we can change EVP but the, we cannot change the return address. Then after receive input returns, then it will eventually get to the function epilog of the uh, run function, and then try to run these two instructions. Then let's follow that. So first instruction is a move EVP to ESP. So ESP will be this value. And then, the next semantical is instruction inside the leave is pop EBP. Uh, can you guess what will happen if the CPU tries to run pop EBP in this case? Yes, that's right. So the 
current address for ESP is a 0x64, 64, 64, 64, 64 like arbitrary value. That's not a valid address at all. Yeah. And then pop EVP actually means that we need to access the memory pointed address pointed by ESP and then move that data to EVP and then move ESP four byte up. Yeah. That's the semantic of the pop EVP. But because the address 64 something is invalid, so it will crash at that point. So that means we cannot do successful attack. But yeah. And then let's check that the, how it runs on the debugger too. So the, you just show this on like a diagram. And then let's take a look at in the debugger. So right now, so here the execution point is stopped at here. And then that's the function epilog of the receive input. And then in the stack, how I like the overwrite the data is like the overwrite arbitrary values. And then just for the save the EVP, I changed that to the D, 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 D. So that's why it's 64, 64, 64, 64. And then when we run the leave instruction, so the semantic of the leave instruction is making the value of the ESP to be same as EVP and then pop EVP. And then please focus on the, these two values, ESP and EVP. So after learning the leave instruction, so both EVP and ESP value are changing. So EVP will be changing to the value that we overwrote on the stack. So that will be 64, 64, 64, 64. 64. And then ESP will be the same value of the EVP. So D468, and then because the instruction semantic is pop EBP, so ESP will move four byte up. That's why not D468, so it will be D46C. Yeah, that's how ESP is changing. Yeah, and then so right now our program is so simple that so that's why like after returning from receive input, it will be directly get to the uh, function epilog of the run function. Now we are at the leave instruction here. Then we will run it. Then it says a segmentation fault here at the invalid address, because when we get to this leave point, we change the ESP to 64, 64, 64, 64, and then try to pop it. Then that's invalid address and that's why it's failing. Uh, any questions about like the uh, what happens on the second return? So to summarize it, like the save the EVP is the base point of the stack frame, and then we play the game with the that base point, and then now it is uh, somewhere else invalid address, and then that's why it is crashing. Yeah. So we can change save the EVP in these challenges, but we cannot change the return address. And then if we do so, uh, it generates a segmentation fault. But the reason why the program generates a segmentation fault is because it's an invalid address. And what if we put a valid address for that? So there's no restriction in the binary that like if we put the valid address, then it will work on the, that address. So that's what the, dumb CPUs are doing because they are just running as a, you know, what is written in the code. And then the code is, although the code is intact, we played with the data. So that's why like we can change the program's behavior. Then let's take a look at the, uh, how the frame pointer attack works. And the, the reason why this attack is named as a frame pointer is the, the EBP, the base pointer. Is also called as like the also known as like the uh, stack frame pointer, and that's why like if we call it as a frame pointer attack. And and here uh, the important thing is like we need to know the some of the valid address on the stack where you can control some of the data inside of there. And we will focus on the buffer address on the stack because like the. If you supply the input, it directly goes to the buffer. So if we know the buffer address, then we can manipulate all the data in there. 
So that gives a flexibility of the controlling. So in this case, suppose our original EBP address is at like a FFFFD540 as a stack address. So it could be different in your environment. Uh, the, the reason is, so, <clears throat> so in the program stack, uh, it does not st start with the empty state. So in Linux systems in general, uh, at the very high address of the stack, there will be the full path of the directory and then uh, binary name. Yeah. And then it will have some of the environmental variables and then some of the arguments coming from the command input. Then the main function starts. And then in the environmental variables, uh, it also includes your username and other kind of like your, your specific information. So if your username length is different with mine, then you might have a different address. So like the, uh, don't get like the uh, frustrated if you have a different address and then that's quite natural. So like the, even if the address is different, uh, uh, what we are focusing on is like a relative addressing in the program. So uh, even if uh, your uh, actual uh, debugging does not give the same address, uh, don't get frustrated. So sub so EBP is at there. And then in this example, we will assume that our buffer starts EBP minus 0x10. Then we can safely assume that the EBP minus 0x10 is uh, FFFF D530. And then uh, suppose we can overwrite the buffer up to save the EBP. Then what we will do is we will put the buffer address at the save the EBP. So just to get the one of the valid address. And then let's see what will happen if we return twice. So this is the first return in the receive input. So we will run leave. So ESP will move up to EBP, then pop EBP. So it'll be something like this. So you can now see some of the weird thing is happening. So EBP, ESP, EBP, ESP, that kind of environment, invariant should be there. So EBP should always have a higher address than the ESP because ESP is stack end and then EBP is stack start. But now it's upside down. So something weird is happening. Then it will return. Then ESP is at here touch the return address. Then it will return to the original return address. So eventually get to the point of the function epilog of the re, uh, run. Then let's see how it works. So move EBP to ESP then. ESP will come down here. And then this is a valid address, right? Then we can do pop EBP. Then EBP will be this one. Right. And then next instruction is the return. So where this program will we return to? This address, right? Yeah. So the implication here is that uh, even if you cannot overwrite the return address, so both of the same, the EBP and the return address, they are, both of them are regarded as a control data means that the data that is related to the control flow of the program. And then even if you cannot overwrite the return address, you can create a fake stack frame at your buffer. And then if you change the stack frame pointer to there, then the computers will be completely fooled by that. And then they will believe that this is a new stack frame and then just return to some of the data here. So, yeah. So if you put the address of the get a shell here, yeah, then you can actually execute uh, the get a shell function. Uh, any questions about the, this method? So it has a, just a one level of the interaction. Previously, if you just feel like a 
get a shell function address to up to the return address, you can easily get a shell. But in this case, you need to manipulate this, the program to fool them to believe that the, this kind of the buffer is their new stack frame. Yeah. Then, so if we make the stack composition like this, then first we'll leave return, we'll change EBP and ESP like this. So the important thing is like the now EBP is below the ESP. Something weird is happening. Yeah. And then after that, on the second return, it will also run leave. So it will change EBP value is something weird, but we don't care about that. And then when it gets to the return, then it will return to get a shell. So one of the easy formula that you can launch this attack is that there are many ways of the launching this attack. So if you coin like the uh, save the EVP as like this address, then we need to put the get a shell at here. But uh, I want to give you some of the uh, easy formula that you can directly use. So if you can control save the EVP, then if you change that, EBP value to any kind of address that you have control of the content. Then put the return address at that address plus four. That will make the, you can run get a shell function uh, afterwards, like the two, after having two returns. And the reason why we need to have plus four is, so when we execute leave function, it has pop EVP. So if we point that here, then it will be one block up. That's why we need to point to the, that address plus four. And then at that point, we need to put the uh, address of the getter shell. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. So the only difference between the 64 and 32 bit for now is like the, it has a eight byte or six byte address. And also, like the each blocks for push and pop is eight byte. Yeah, so that's four RBP plus eight. Yeah, and then the overriding the RBP is the same as the EBPs, but that you need to override full eight bytes for that. Yeah. And then, like the I will demonstrate like the how you can solve the challenges. Yeah, for the two challenges, so maybe the buffer overflow level five and then uh, level eight to demonstrate the how it works with the sixty four bit. Yeah, and then the, in the slides, uh, I also leave uh, some of the uh, function calls APIs that uh, you can uh, utilize when you're writing the script for the pawn tools. Yeah. So please refer to these slides whenever you need to refer to some of the useful uh, sentences from there. Yeah. And then like the, these new, these challenges are due on next Monday. Yeah, so please work on that. And then uh, if there, uh, is there any uh, last minute question before I start the tutorial? Then let's move on to the tutorial. So let's get onto the machine and then we will solve the buffer flow level five. Yeah. And then the, from readme, uh, you can see that the, there is a stack composition and then the, it says the buffer is a EVP minus zero x 80. Yeah. And then now, right now I'm seeing that the, some of the students that do not take a look at the, where the buffer is from the disassembly, but I highly recommend to do that first because uh, in starting from week four, uh, I will not give like the, this kind of the hint. Yeah. And then to do that, uh, I will 
uh, do the little bit of reverse engineering. Uh, so we are focusing on the receive input function, and then we can easily see that, that there is a read function, and then push zero means that the first argument of the read is zero, and then push eax, the second argument of the read, the buffer address is from coming from eax, and then that's actually coming from ebp minus zero x80. Yeah, and this is how you can identify the distance between the buffer to save the EVP. Yeah. So please do a practice like the doing this kind of thing uh, before getting into the uh, solving the challenge. Yeah. So now we know that the, our buffer size is at the, it can uh, store up to 128 bytes because that's the 0x80. And then after filling 128 bytes, if we overwrite four more bytes, then that will be overriding the save EVP. So that's why uh, this uh, stack composition is like that. So we have a 128 bytes for the buffer, but the, your input is allowed up to 132 bytes. And then that information, you can also check that from here. So the, this is the third argument for the return, uh, read function. And then 0x84 is actually the four byte more than the buffer. Yeah. And then that's the condition. So if it allows uh, input up to 136 bytes, then you can overwrite the return address, but in this case, you cannot overwrite the return address. Okay. Then we will start with the template. Then our target program is this one. If, we, if, I, if, I, if I run it, and then it's just uh, waiting for our input, then we can fill the input. So, Let's get into the exploit template. And uh, because we will use debugger, let's copy the binary as a buffer overflow level X. Then later we will use five, yeah. Then this is the thing. I will just uh, leave a Peter interactive here. Then check if it runs correctly yeah it runs well then just the font size a little bit can you see some of the characters here so the important thing is like the taking a look at the register values and then that's why, yeah. If the font is too big, like the, it's uh, not showing on here, yeah. And then the, what we will be focusing on is the, the return of the receive input. So we will set the breakpoint at here. So receive input plus 32 is the leave instruction. So I will do that. So and here. We will set the breakpoint at the receive input plus 32. And then what we will do is, so we can put any kind of the long string and then like a put some of the value uh, to like test it, whether that like, we hit the EBP or not. So now we know that the exact buffer size, so then might be 128. And then let's put BBBB for testing. So we are expecting that the program should crash with the address 62, uh, the, 42, 42, 42, 42. This is a big B. So we're not the real payload, but the petition payload is something like this. And then we send this. And let's take a look at how it goes. So now the program start at, stop at the leave instruction. And uh, we are seeing that at the location of the EVP, 
it's stored at 42, 42, 42, 42. That means like our uh, overriding value is there. And then another thing to check is, so you can always check like how your stack stores the value and then you will see lots of the 41, 41, 41, this kind of thing. And then to get the exact location of the buffer, we know that from the disassembly, we know that the buffer is at EBP minus 0x80, right? So what I will do is EBP minus 0x80. We can also print that. And that's actually the start of the buffer. Yeah. And then you will see that the, all these values are A. And then it overwritten the saved EBP at here. Yeah. Then this is how you can identify the buffer address. So then now the buffer address is fffd 3 e 8 Yeah. So we will keep that in mind. Then at the same time, what we will gonna do is, so now we are at the leave instruction. So I will just run that instruction. So this is status after running the leave instruction. So now our EBP has been changed to the BBBB and then ESP was going up and then it returns to the run function. So because we didn't change the return address, it returns to the, uh, the correct position. And then it goes to the run and then there's a knob instruction. So knob is a no up, it does nothing. So you can ignore that. And then the reason it has a knob instruction is that the, uh, so for CPUs, they are fetching memory address better if the address is even number or if the address is aligned with the eight or 16 bytes. So that's why compiler inserted knob instruction to make the leave and return, uh, leave instruction to be like the aligned as a uh, even number or something. Yeah. So you can think of it as a, this is a filler for like the, from the uh, compiler to make the uh, execution more faster or something. Yeah. So on the second leave instruction, uh, the semantic is like the able move ESP to EVP and then pop. And then definitely it crashes because like the, uh, this is an invalid address. But uh, now, but we know that, uh, Uh, it doesn't matter that, yeah. So this was the address, right? D3E8, yeah, right. So we know that buffer address is D3E8. So the, now we will put that address to the saved EVP. So let's do that. So the important thing here is that the using GDB, we can identify the buffer address not as a relative addressing from EBP. And then we can get the real address, D3 E8, uh, D8, right? And then from the script, now we can put, instead of the BBBB, we can put D3 E8. Yeah. And then let's see how it runs. So now we are at the leave instruction. And then now the EBP points to the somewhere we store the, and then like the, we put the D3E8 as the value inside of that location. So after learning the leave instruction, we can have ESP to the correct position, but the now EBP is somewhere in the buffer. And you can also see that the value of the EBP is has the lesser value than ESP. D4 and D3, this value is lesser. So we made it as a something upside down. Yeah. And then it returns to the run function. We will ignore now up. And then at the second leave, then what it does is like it will move ESP to here and pop EBP so that we can expect that EBP will be AAAA. And then ESP will be D3EC because plus four will be there after pop. So we now we have a EBP as a, this one. 
and then ESP is a D3EC, right? And then the next instruction is return. So that's why it returns to AAAA, yeah. So this is also a valid address, but uh, I just put AAA to like the make it making this kind of crash, but the, we can replace those kind of the A's to the uh, address of the getter shell. Yeah. Then it will give you the shell. And let's try to do that. So we have a getter shell address here, and then We can use P32 get a shell because this is the integer value. And then we will fill up to 128 bytes. So each of the P32 will return four bytes. And then that's why I divided 128 by four. So making this part exactly to be 128 bytes. And then let's take a look at how it runs. So on the first leave, do the same thing. Yeah, move the EVP like the lower address than the ESP. Then now the EVP has a lots of like a getter shell uh, address. And then it will return to the run function. And then on the second leave, it will move ESP to EVP. And then now it returns to getter shell function. So that's how you can control the stack and then running the gather shell function. Uh, any questions about the, this approach? Then I'd like to introduce another method to solve it more easily. Yeah. So this is the, uh, uh, another thing is like that we can uh, dynamically solve this challenge by replacing some of the problematic value to some of the address. So how can you do that? It's like the right now we know the uh, the buffer address, and instead of the putting a a a a or something, there is a function cyclic, then gets a length of the string as an argument. And then what it does is like, uh, I will show you. So it returns a string, but uh, each of like the four characters are unique in the buffer. So it will be starting with the AAAA, BAAA, CAAA, DAAA. So like it will have like a unique four byte quadlet yeah, in the buffer. And then the reason why this is useful is that whenever you have a crash, there will be address value that is problematic. Then you can easily identify which one of the four bytes are problematic. Yeah. So what that means is that, so I just put the cyclic and then this address, then I will just run it. Just continue. So now it says like an invalid address DAAA, right? That means if you change this VAAA as an address of the getter shell, yeah, then it will run. So statically, we can analyze it thoroughly. You can find that where the location you need to put the getter shell. That's the one method. And then dynamically, we can use this kind of the cyclic function to have a unique quadlet yeah, of the each uh, data. And then whenever it crashes, then we can identify uh, where in the buffer we need to fix that. Yeah. So that's the thing. Then after you finish the debugging, uh, just remove the debugger and uh, run target the, the real binary program, then it will give you the shell.
Any questions? So it has like the uh, specific rule. So it will always start to the AAAA, BAAA, but uh, as long as you put a large length and then like a, you can get guarantee that the, each four quadlet is uh, unique. Yeah. So that you, you can also programmatically find the target. So for example, uh, what that means is that suppose, uh, So we can set the payload as S plus. So we use a D3E8, but the, let me use some of the different address. So it's not the exact the start of the buffer, but the somewhere in the buffer. Yeah, maybe this is also possible, I believe. Yeah, so I just uh, put the different address, but it will definitely crash, right? So. Let's check that first. I know with the debugger. Uh, if I move too fast, and let me know. Yeah. So this is a read leave, and then I will run the second leave. Then oh, it crashed at E A A A, right? Then that's where we need to put the uh four by thing and what we can do is this is the position of the eaaa right is that the right syntax i'm not good i'm not that good at like a python and using find function <laughs> and then like that we can do is So we can also like the formulate the payload like this, then it will directly replace this one into this value, right? So that this is one of the easy method that you can crash it first. And then after identifying that, you can just change the method. But uh, uh, please do this after you get familiar with the original method, because it's very important to understand that. Yeah, so it has a lot of the, this kind of the thing. So. So same thing happens for the like the Ghidra decompiler and then disassembly. So the reason why I do not get to the shortcut first is like the, if I do so, then you cannot learn about the details. Yeah. Then let's try to run it. Huh. Yeah, it's quite wrong. So we need to change like the, what is that? Uh, D A A A. In that case, find D A A A, then run it. Right now, it gets to the get a shell function. Yeah, this is how you can easily solve the challenges. So after you get familiar with the manual technique, so you can use the this kind of method. And then this is an easier version of the uh, frame pointer attack. And then the more advanced version of the flow level seven and eight. And then I will demonstrate the eight because it's a 64 bit. Yeah, better to watch that, the, how it goes and the 64 bit too. And then the, it also has like the, this kind of the uh, description, but uh, let's get into the binary first. So this is the disassembly of the receive input. So it has a little bit of like a more complex instructions, but uh, don't worry about that. So these are like the move zero extension, uh, long value as a byte or something. Yeah, so it's just a move instruction. Yeah, and then move instruction from like the eight byte to one byte and then that kind of thing. So, and then whenever you are curious about like the instruction, 
then you can search about the instruction name and x86 on Google. Then there will be some of the beautiful uh, website that describes it, like what is the semantic of the dense instruction. And then what we will be focusing is like the, uh, there will be some of the function. What is that? Uh, there's an f gets function. Yeah, that's the function that receives the input. And then let's take a look at the how many bytes gets. Yeah, so the first argument, uh, the, so the argument passing is uh, based on their di, si, and then dx, cx in 64 bit. Yeah, so and here, the first argument is this one. Uh, I might be confused about the, why it gets to the, the input to the, what is that, the buffer? Ah, it is a mem copy, yeah. So what it does is like the, it will get like the 128 bytes, yeah, to the uh, 256 bytes, and then it will just copy like the 100, uh, 20, uh, 29 bytes, yeah. So uh, let's not get into here. <laughs> Just read with the read me, yeah. <laughs> so the so the here the restriction is that the buffer size is in one twenty eight, yeah. But uh, what you can do is like you can overwrite just uh, one more byte, yeah. And then let's see how it works in the, the at the runtime. So. Uh, just get the template then. We'll work with the level eight and uh, to use the debugger, I will copy as a buffer full level X. Yeah, and then. So we have a main function, main function runs, run. We have a run function, it puts a lot and then it runs the receive input. And then, so this is actually the loop that uh, write uh, 129 bytes. And then we will be focusing on like the leave instruction at here. And then the reason why it says leave Q is Q means a word here and then q indicates a uh, eight bytes 64 bit here yeah so the whenever you see q then that's the 64 bit instruction and then l means long so you might then like a mov l so move long and then that's for like a moving four byte 32 bit value that's the thing and then we will set the breakpoint at the receive input plus a 101 yeah We will do that. Then we will also put the, some of the value as payload. And then I will just put uh, 128 bars first. Yeah. And then let's take a look at what happens. Me too. Size of the font. Ah, because we have a f gets function, I need to put the new line at the end. Maybe uh, I will put 128 byte of the A and then one byte of B and then new line because uh, it will accept the input up to 129 bytes, yeah. Well, let's take a look at that and then I will do continue. So now we, our execution stopped at the leave instruction, yeah. And then if I 
run it through. So can you see that the, our RVP value has been changed? But in this case, we cannot overwrite the full eight bytes or six bytes of the RVP address. So we can only overwrite the last byte. And then 42 is B, definitely, right? So that, that's the thing, yeah. But the, can you see that like the sum of the condition? So can you see that the, can we attack with this condition? So the question is specifically, so we have EBP here, ESP here, and then we had a buffer in the middle. And then to make attack possible, we need to get EBP down in the middle of the buffer, right? And then right now, RSP is somewhere E2 something, RBP is E342. So that kind of upside down thing is not happening at all. Yeah. So the challenge here is that, so what I mean is like the value of the RBP is bigger than RSP. But what we need is like the value of the, the address value of the buffer is definitely lower than the previous EBP. So we need to have like this kind of the inversion case. So, but in this case, no matter what kind of value you put here. So zero to FF, these are the values are possible. No matter what kind of value you put there, always RSP will be down there. So inversion will never happen. So in this condition, we cannot solve the challenge. So the, what I mean is like the, we have a RVP here, RSP here, and then we have a buffer here. And then as a result, we want to change RVP to point somewhere here, but the, it will always point to somewhere upper here. Yeah, that's this problem. Then can we, how can you make uh, EAB, RVP points to in the middle? And then to do that, we need to manipulate with the address. So suppose, uh, suppose our, uh, I will just use a 32 bin notation. Uh, to have a, like a shorter address, but that, that does not affect on the uh, 64 by one. Suppose our uh, EVP has the value as F, 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 D, this one, and then ESP was F, 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 D, two, something like this. Then right now you can overwrite this byte. So lowest address you can point is this one. Highest address you can point is this one. Yeah. So in that case, if you point, so the buffer address is somewhere here, but the, in this case, you cannot change this value, that means there will be no case that you can make the EVP value down there than like ESP. So what you need is you need to make some of the address arrangement is something like, something like this. Then, now we can change the last byte of the EVP. And what if we put this? Then this address is definitely lower address than ESP. So even if we can only change the last byte of EVP, we can create that kind of inversion case. In that case, we can solve the challenge. then you will be much more clear after seeing like the, how the, all the process will be finishing. So that right now the problem is that the, we can overwrite this byte, but the, we cannot overwrite this one. So no matter what we do, this value cannot be smaller than this one. Yeah. 
So this is the case. So in this case, you cannot solve the challenge. Then how can you change this kind of status? That's your next question. And then, so uh, when we run the program, so I briefly described the bell like the on the program stack, it will have your path name, and then environment or variable arguments, and then run it. So stack address is determined by those kind of the external value to the program, the environmental variable. So let me show you the examples of the environmental variable are these kind of stuff. Yeah. All these stuffs are like they're stored into the stack, but if you can make sum up this environmental variable longer, then your stack moves down shorter than your stack moves up. So you can actually control the address by manipulating this kind of environmental variable. And then uh, ways of setting the environmental variables, there are a lot of method. And then we can use some of this. So we can create the one of the dictionary and then this kind of the A, B pair will be uh, A equal B, something like a, uh, in the, like the environmental variable. So we are actually adding some of the more rows in there. And then we can insert that, that kind of environment variable to our execution context. Yeah. And then we will see how the address was, will be changing with the new environmental variable. What is that? Ah. Might be this, right? Yeah. So I will do continue it here. So now we are at the leave instruction. And then can you see that now our RBP and RSP has the same, the third last address digit, right? Then if we change this into one zero, 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 three, zero, then that will be definitely lesser value than RSP, right? So that we can make this kind of the inversion case. So the, this is very important to solve like the, the level seven and level eight. So that there is a certain condition you can never solve the challenge uh, depending on the address value, not the last byte, but the second last byte of the last, the last digit. So you need to make the these digits to be equal. Then by manipulating the last byte, you can move RBP down below the RSP. That's how you can solve it. So now we know that the RSP has the value as is four eight. Yeah. Then what I will do is I will change this V into one zero. Then I try to avoid the using zero zero because like uh, some of the cases, like the if the input function uh, only accepts a string, then we cannot put null bytes. Uh, that's why I try to avoid the zero zero. So it's better to have that kind of habit. Yeah. So and then I will run it. Continue. So now we are at the leave instruction. After running this, now we see that that, that inversion happened, right? RBP is, has a lower address than RSP. And then it has a, 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 a something, right? And then now we know what to do is just to put the address of the ghetto shell at there. And then let's use cyclic, yeah? Put it here and run it.
it works. But it stopped at this location, okay? So if we change that value into the getter shell, then it will run getter shell, okay? Then let's do that. So in 64 bit, you should use P64. And then so I just replaced that eight bytes to the ghetto shell function address, and then run it. So leave inversion happened. Oh, so address has been changed. So sometimes it happens, but you can adjust that. So let's change it at that to this one. Yeah, right. Oh, it changes a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now leave. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I got confused. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> the value is correct. But uh, I saw the wrong value on the first return. That's why. Yeah. So it will leave and return. And then leave, and then it returns to the get a shell function. Yeah. So even if there's a restriction that we can only overwrite the one byte, then we can overflow that, and we can successfully attack the uh, buffer overflow vulnerability. And then this is so-called the frame pointer attack. And then can you guess why do we have a specific case of like the overriding one byte? That's right, yes. That's the important part. So most of the security vulnerabilities happens because programmer made a mistake. So what programmer expect is different in the binary. And then that's what we are exploiting. And then some of the example code that may generate this kind of error is, so suppose you have a, Something like uh, something like this. So this is the wrong part, right? There should be no equal sign, yeah. But uh, sometimes developer may made a mistake for the having a one equal sign, and then that will lead to the, just a one byte overflow. And then implication of the, this challenge is that uh, that kind of small mistake can lead to the arbitrary code execution to like the hackers. Yeah. So that that's why like that this kind of example is quite famous. So I also like uh, stole the idea from like a historical one. Yeah. So that's why we have uh, that challenge. Uh, any questions? So maybe some of you already finished it and then some of you are ready to go for like the pointing the, these two. Yeah. So then from now on, uh, please work on the challenges and feel free to ask any questions to our TA Lucas and then myself. Yeah. And then like the, for those who are waiting for the week three challenges, so that I will release in a few days and then like the, uh, another thing is like that I was last night I was writing code for like the uh, there's a so called uh, brain fuck the, which is an esoteric language and then like the I'm preparing a extra credit challenge uh, that you need to play with the, that language to trigger the buff overflow vulnerability. <laughs> yeah so like that will be fun and then so uh, and then don't get too much burdensome for like, those kind of extra credit challenge and these are for fun yeah. 
and then like it, these will just add the score to you. So like the, don't worry much if you cannot solve the challenge. Yeah. All right. 